Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on a Tuesday here on Reason and Theology. We're going over the question, why was Martin Luther excommunicated? You know, there was a bull written by a pope in 1520, Pope Leo X, excommunicating Martin Luther if he did not retract certain errors. And in this bull, he lists what the problems with Luther was. Um, but he doesn't necessarily give an exhaustive list of Luther's errors. Um, in fact, such a thing would have been nearly impossible to do uh, in, all in one place. So he just kind of summarized some of the errors into certain propositions, and he condemns them. Um, and he says that Luther has 60 days to retract these errors, either in the presence of two clergymen um, <clears throat> or in person with safe conduct. Um, so he would come to Rome with safe conduct and personally recant in front of the Pope. Um, either option the Pope gave to him. And as we know, Martin Luther, the, if you will, the founder of the Protestant rebellion, uh, chose to ignore the papal bull, ripped it up, and uh, ignored it. And so he was excommunicated. And I want to go over what were the reasons that the Pope listed as heirs of Martin Luther. I'm sharing my screen so that we can take a look at them. Again, here is the papal bull. You can find it online. It's called Exerge Domine, Condemning the Heirs of Martin Luther, again by Pope Leo X. In 1520, uh, you'll notice again, this is 1520 and not 1517, which is when he nailed his 95 theses uh, to the door of uh, Wittenberg. Um, that is not really when the Reformation started. And that's also not when um, the, M Martin Luther really went into rebellion against the Catholic faith. As we see, it was... Um, it was a little bit later, and it was kind of a slow process. It was a, a gradual thing for him. If you look at the 95 Theses, in it, he still affirms the papacy and several other things that he would later on renounce. Okay, so let's maybe look at some of the errors that the Pope lists as condemned. And he does mention that they're condemned in various ways. Some of these are heretical in nature, whereas others aren't necessarily heretical but they're offensive to pious ears. They're bad sounding, if you will. And there's also a wide range of other um, uh, degrees of error in between those two extremes. Um, and some of these propositions fall within one of those degrees of error. But not everything in here that is being condemned is heresy. Some are heretical. Some are lower degrees of error. Um, again, going all the way down to just merely something that's bad sounding, even though it might be true, it just sounds bad. It sounds misleading. It could be ambiguous. It could lead to error if misunderstood. Okay, so proposition number one that is condemned. And again, all of these are condemned propositions that Luther affirmed. It is a heretical opinion, but a common one that the sacraments of the new law, that is the new covenant, the New Testament, give pardoning grace to those who do not set up an obstacle. So this strikes at the heart of the sacramental system in the New Testament, because for those who are not setting up an obstacle between them and God, they do receive pardoning grace through the reception of the sacraments, because they are what's called ex opere operato. Uh, so they're, they're not because of the worthiness of the minister or something like that, but it's because of the action done and because of the promises that God has made in association with doing those actions. Um, so as long as the person isn't putting up a personal obstacle when they receive these sacraments, um, then they validly receive the sacraments and receive God's pardoning grace. Well, Luther was denying that, and so that was condemned. Another proposition, Proposition 2, to deny that in a child after baptism sin remains is to treat with contempt both Paul and Christ. Also problematic because once sins are washed away, according to St. Paul, in baptism, 
Paul notes this in multiple pl places, including Acts. Um, so when sins are washed away in baptism, and that would include children, um, what we can say remains is not sin per se. No, sin is washed away, but rather still a disposition to sin, what we would call concupiscence. Uh, concupiscence, I'm sorry, uh, concupiscence. Um, it's a disposition to sin rather than an actual presence of sin in one's soul. Uh, so also condemned. The inflammable sources of sin, even if there be no actual sin, delay a soul departing from the body from entrance into heaven. So this is kind of like saying, well, you know, even, even if you don't have actual sin, if you just kind of have this concupiscence, you, you just have this disposition to sin that delays um, a soul's um, entrance into heaven, that would be incorrect. Uh, concupiscence is not something that is uh, going to uh, keep somebody away. Um, however, we could say an attachment to sin and stuff like that, that would, but just the ability to or disposition to sin doesn't necessarily keep somebody from heaven. It would rather be actual sin or an attachment to sin, um, which would be addressed in purgatory or the state of purgation. To one on the point of death, imperfect charity necessarily brings with it great fear, which is... Uh, which in itself alone is enough to produce the punishment of purgatory and impedes entrance into the kingdom. So this is kind of like saying, well, if you are on your deathbed and you're afraid of condemnation, that alone is enough to put you into purgatory um, and impede one's entrance into heaven. Um, which which is absurd. Um, he's effectively saying, well, you have to have this perfect trust in Jesus Christ. Well, one can have a sufficient trust in Jesus Christ um, and enter into heaven without it being this perfect trust. But he's denying that. That there are three parts to penance, contrition, confession, and satisfaction, has no foundation in sacred scripture nor in the ancient sacred Christian doctrine or doctors. Well, that's absurd. You can find all three aspects, contrition, you know, actually being sorry for your sin because, um, because of a love for God, confession, turning away from your sin and expressing that verbally, and satisfaction, doing penance. That's also found in sacred scripture. Contrition, which is acquired through discussion, collection, and detestation of sins, by which one reflects upon his years and the bitterness of his soul by pondering over the gravity of sins, their number, their baseness, the loss of eternal beatitude, and the acquisition of eternal dam damnation. This contrition makes him a hypocrite, indeed more a sinner. So if you have a contrition that is of this nature, um, and it is acquired through maybe certain fears of a loss of eternal beatitude or something like that. That makes you a hypocrite and more of a sinner. I mean, this is pretty absurd. It is a, mo and, and by the way, you could totally understand why Luther was a very scrupulous person. I don't know who could meet the bar <laughs> that he is setting here. Um, it is a most truthful proverb, and the doctrine concerning the contritions given thus far in, uh, is the more remarkable. Not to do so in the future is the highest penance, the best practice, a new life. He's saying that is a truthful proverb. Not to do so in the future is the highest penance. So in other words, what's the greatest penance? Don't commit the sin. That's the greatest penance. Well... It's not a penance. That's an avoidance of sin. That's not a penance. A penance deals with more people who have already committed the sin. Um, so it's it at the very least doesn't sound accurate. Uh, by no means may you presume to confess venial sins, nor even all mortal sins, because it is impossible that you know all mortal sins. 
Hence, in the primitive church, only manifest mortal sins were confessed. So he's saying, you, by no means, may you presume that you've confessed all your venial sins and all your mortal sins, because it's impossible to really know all your mortal sins. Also, not true. I think a thorough examination of conscience, especially if a person's going to confession relatively frequently or just regularly, I think they can know how many uh, mortal sins or at the very least grave sins that they've committed. As long as we wish to confess all sins without exception, we are doing nothing else than to wish to leave nothing to God's mercy for pardon. That's a weird way of looking at it. <laughs> It's he's saying, well, if you confess all your sins, you're not leaving any room for God's mercy to pardon things that you haven't confessed. What? <laughs> so you want God to forgive something that you don't confess? That's odd. Now, if it's something that you don't confess because you're not aware of it, that's fine, of course. But it's another to say, well, you know, you actually know what it is, and I'm not going to list all of those sins. Maybe I'll list only 75% of them because I kind of want to leave some room for God's grace to pardon me for things I don't mention. It's just a very odd way of looking at things. Sins are not forgiven to anyone unless when the priests forgive them, he believes they are forgiven. So you have to believe you are forgiven. On the contrary, the sin would remain unless he believed it was forgiven. For indeed, the remission of sin and the granting of grace does not suffice, but it is necessary also to believe that there has been forgiveness. Now, if the sacrament is ex opere operato, forgiveness is there. The problem is you aren't receiving it unless you believe it. Um, by no means can you have reassurance of being absolved because of your contrition but because of the word of Christ. So you don't have assurance because you're sorry and you've been absolved. No, your assurance is because of the words of Christ, whatever you shall lose. Um, uh, hence, I, I say, trust confidently if you have obtained the absolution of the priest and firmly believe yourself to have been absolved and you will truly be absolved, whatever uh, there may be of contrition. If through an impossibility, he who confessed was not contrite, or the priest did not absolve seriously, but in a uh, joking manner. If nevertheless he believes that he has been absolved, he is most truly absolved. Well, you wouldn't receive sacramental absolution if, you know, it wasn't actually a priest. Um, it, it wouldn't be sacramental absolution. So just because you believe you've been absolved doesn't necessarily make it so sacramentally. Now, God may extend absolution to an individual apart from the sacrament and sacramental absolution due to maybe a person's ignorance, not knowing that they went to somebody who isn't a priest or something like that. So one may be absolved in one sense, but not a sacramental absolution. So I could certainly see this being something offensive to pious ears or bad sounding. In the sacrament of penance and the remission of sin, the Pope or the bishop does no more than the lowest priest. Indeed, where there is no priest, any Christian, even if a woman or child, may equally do as much. So anybody can absolve a person from their sin, is, is what Luther is saying. And Trent responded to that and said, no, uh, following the steps of Aquinas on this point and the longstanding tradition of the church, uh, both Aquinas and Trent are going to note for a sacramental absolution, you have to have a validly ordained priest. However, Trent and Aquinas are going to note um, and, and leave room for um, absolution that it can come from a layman in cases of necessity where no priest is available. It's not a sacramental absolution. Uh, Aquinas calls it a quasi-sacramental uh, absolution. So there is an absolution that can be granted from a layman, but it is not sacramental in nature. Uh, whereas he's saying, yes, it is sacramental in nature. Uh, number 14, no one ought to answer a priest that he is contrite, nor should the priest inquire. Also odd. Um, nothing wrong with a priest asking a person if they're sorry for their sins. 
Uh, great is the error of those who approach the sacrament of the Eucharist relying on this, that they have confessed that they are not conscious of any mortal sin, that they have sent their prayers on ahead and made preparations. All these eat and drink judgment to themselves, he says. They eat judgment on themselves. But if they believe and trust that they will attain grace, then this faith alone makes them pure and worthy. It seems to have been decided that the church and common council established that the laity should communicate under both species. The Bohemians who communicate under both species are not heretics but schismatics. Now, it is certainly acknowledged by Trent, Constance, and many others that it is apostolic uh, for the laity to receive communion under both kinds, the appearances of bread and wine. Um, but in that time, there was a restriction uh, where the laity were receiving only under one kind. And there were practical reasons why, but the point of the church was that, well, when you receive under one appearance, you receive the full body, blood, and soul of divinity, so you've received the whole thing. Um, and so in order to avoid the precious blood being spilled and things like that, we're going to receive under one kind. Um, now, obviously, the church has reversed that since Vatican II. Uh, which I think is a great thing. But the Bohemians and others are heretics because they were saying, no, you have to receive both. Otherwise, you're not really receiving the full body, blood, and soul of divinity of Christ. So the doctrine of concomitance, uh, concomitance um, or that, again, that Jesus is their body, blood, soul, and divinity in every particle, if you will. Um, he, you know, or they would deny and that is a heresy. That's the heresy of eutroquism. Um, <clears throat> but Luther is saying, no, they're not heretics for that, when in fact they are. Um, and St. Paul is, in fact, quoted by Constance uh, to show that uh, uh, the Bohemians were wrong in this. The treasures of the church from which the Pope grants indulgences are not the merits of Christ and the saints. You know, it, one huge thing that he was against was indulgences. Um, and so he's going to go into a series of claims about indulgences. We kind of already gone through a, a whole bunch about confession so far. That was a big thing for him. Again, one of the, one of the problems that Luther had is he was incredibly scrupulous. I mean, he would go to confession and then within a few minutes, go back to confession. I mean, he was just really scrupulous and he felt he couldn't find the mercy of God until he was, on the toilet reading, I think, Romans, and he all of a sudden feel that felt that he had discovered the gospel. Uh, and that's a real story, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think they called it the Thunderbox back then. He was on the Thunderbox. And uh, he was reading, I think, Augustine's commentary on Romans, and he felt like he discovered the truth and it helped deal with all of his scrupulosity. So he felt like, well, the Catholic practice of confession just makes people more scrupulous, and so it's wrong. And so he kind of had uh, a whole lot against it. Um, and so that's why we've he's spent a whole lot of propositions here uh, railing against confession. But now we turn to indulgences. Indulgences are pious frauds of the faithful and remission of good works. And they are among the number of those things which are allowed and not of the number of those things which are advantageous. So they're not advantageous and they're frauds. Uh, indulgences are of no avail to those who truly gain them for the remission of the penalty due to actual sin and the sight of divine justice. They are seduced who believe that indulgences are salutary and useful for the fruit of the spirit. Indulgences are necessary only for public crimes and are properly conceded only to the harsh and impatient for six kinds of men indulgences are neither necessary nor useful namely for the dead so no indulgences for the dead for luther and those about to die the infirm those legitimately hindered and those who have not committed crimes and those who have committed crimes but not public ones and those who devote themselves to better things okay Excommunication are only external penalties. They do not deprive man of the common spiritual prayers of the church. Christians must be taught to cherish excommunications rather than fear them. <laughs> that sounds like Luther to me. 
he would often say these very just outrageous things, uh, you know, things that would just shock you. I think that was deliberate. Christians must be taught to cherish excommunications rather than fear them. <laughs> Sounds like some people today. Not naming names. The Roman pontiff, the successor of Peter, is not the vicar of Christ over all the churches of the entire world instituted by Christ himself in Blessed Peter. Now that's heresy, right? The word of Christ to Peter, whosoever you shall loose on earth, is extended merely to those things bound by Peter himself. So it's not those things um, that are uh, perhaps uh, beyond Peter's authority or perhaps something imposed by God. It is certain that it is not in the power of the church or the pope to decide upon the articles of faith and much less concerning the laws for morals or for good works. If the pope with a great part of the church thought so and so, so and so, he would not err. Still, it is not a sin or heresy to think the contrary, especially in a matter not necessary for salvation until one alternative is condemned and another approved by a general council. So this is kind of the idea of... Uh, um, ecumenical council over the Pope. A way has been made for us for weakening the authority of councils and for freely contradicting their actions and judging their decrees and boldly confessing whatever seems true, whether it be uh, whether it has been approved or disapproved by a council or any council whatsoever. Some articles of John Huss condemned by the Council of Constance are most Christian, so he's clearly going against the Council of Constance. Holy, true, and evangelical. These the universal church could not condemn. So, I mean, that's just straight up against an ecumenical council. In every good work, the just man sins. Gosh. Wow. So in every good work, the righteous man sins. Whew. Talk about scrupulous. Talk about a, a standard of perfection uh, that nobody can meet. Um. And what he'll say is, well, of course, nobody can meet it. That's why you need the imputation of Christ. And so now we get into the imputation debate. A good work done very well is a venial sin. That heretics be burned is against the will of the Spirit. I, I did a whole show treating that one. To go to war against the Turks is to resist God. Turks is, uh, you know, a group of Muslims at the time, is to resist God who punishes our in iniquities through them. So God is using these Muslims to punish us. So to go to war against them is to go to war against God. No one is certain that he is not always sinning mortally because of the most hidden vice of pride. So you might just all the time be sinning mortally. You don't know because of pride. Free will after sin is a matter of title only, free will. Uh, and as long as one does what is in him, one sins mortally. Purgatory cannot be proved from Scripture, which is in the canon. Uh, the souls in purgatory are not sure of their salvation, at least not all, nor is it proved by any arguments or by the Scriptures that they are beyond the state of meriting or of increasing in charity. He says, the souls of purgatory sin without intermission, as long as they seek rest and abhor punishment. The souls freed from purgatory by suffrages of the living are less happy than if they had made satisfaction by themselves. And then ecclesiastical prelates and secular princes would not act badly if they destroyed all of the money bags of beggary. <laughs> Oh, uh, all right. Well, of these things, uh, Leo X says, um, by our own authority, we condemn, reprobate, and reject completely each of these theses or errors as either heretical, so it's either heresy, scandalous, false, offensive to pious ears, or seductive of simple minds and against Catholic truth. So, they fall within one of these, you know, all those propositions. He doesn't tell us which which one is heretical, which one is scandalous, but he's given what's called a global censor, which is saying, you know, all 41 of these, they fall under one of these categories. You know, uh, one can fall under heresy. Another one can just be false. Another can be offensive to bias ears and so on. 
By listing them, we decree and declare that all the faithful of both sexes must regard them as condemned, reprobated, and rejected. We restrain all in the virtue of holy obedience and under the penalty of an automatic major excommunication. And then he gives him uh, 60 days. Let me go to it here. Yeah. Gave him basically 60 days uh, to recant, which we know at the end of the day, he did not do. Uh, even though he says, you know, anybody, including Luther, uh, who would repent of this, they would be received with open arms, with the affection of a father's love. Unfortunately, he did not accept the correction and, uh, yeah, initiated one of the worst rebellions in uh, Christian history that is still ongoing to this day, unfortunately. Well, anyways, I hope this was helpful to kind of review some of the reasons why Luther was condemned. If y'all thought this was interesting, let me know that in the comment section. Be sure to hit the like button and also the subscribe button if you want to support me and get access to extra content that I provide for patrons only and to support what I'm doing here. All right, that's going to do it, y'all. We'll see you next time. God bless. Hey, everybody, just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. Reasonandtheology.com. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.